So this leads us up to one of the famous um, events, which is the March on Washington in August 28th, 1963. Um, the full title being um, March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Um, although um, the 15th, 14th and 15th Amendments of the Constitution were intended to secure black rights after the Civil War, they were never really realized. And so it became one of the most highly publicized marches um, to try to secure those rights um, for black citizens. And so more than 250,000 people gathered in Washington, D.C. and tried to illuminate the political and social challenges confronting them um, as a people there. So you've probably seen pictures of this before, a very famous um, protest on um, Washington, D.C. Martin Luther King, who we don't talk extensively about in this class because um, he's not a woman, um, this march culminated with his I Have a Dream speech um, about racial justice and equality, and so I have included that on the Moodle for you guys to listen to. Um, a lot of the male civil rights leadership declined to allow women to speak in the program at the march. Um, Though it did make sense for um, Martin Luther King to be sort of the public figure because he was very popular by this time. Um, Anna Arnold Hedgeman of the National Council of Churches said that they must have at least one female speaker um, as all of the speakers lined up were men. Um, and so they were able to convince them to include um, Daisy Bates, who we talked about with um, the nine students that went to... Um, integrate into the central high school um central high school yeah that's it um so he she was able to speak um as the only female allowed to speak at the march on washington um afterwards black women leaders like dorothy height and hedgeman vowed that women would not be excluded in the future from these events and also it's been interesting to see um in 2020 with the movement for black lives matter for um very similar look in washington dc which um is inspiring but also tragic that we still have to sort of put on these mass events um to be able to get rights for black citizens and equality we also have that shortly after the march march on washington we have another um, tragic event, um, unfortunately, and this is at the 16th uh, Street Baptist Church, and Martin Luther King used to um, speak there uh, from time to time as he was a reverend and gave sermons, um, and on September 15th, 1963, so um, not even a month later, um, this church was bombed, and this church was working with the civil rights movement in actions in collection, and a white supremacist group um, and four members of the local KKK put 196 of dynamite in this church and blew it up. Um, Martin Luther King called it one of the most vicious and tragic crimes ever perpetuated against humanity. The explosion at the church killed four girls and injured between 14 and 22 people. Um, and not until 1977 uh, did they have cases to try these people, which is absolutely insane. So... Um, I think only one of them ended up being even convicted. So that's, what, 14 years later uh, that they actually convicted anybody of this crime. Um, but it was a really tragic moment in um, right after the March on Washington. And people were really sort of um, taken aback by this act of violence. So... Um, John F. Kennedy really started to pursue plans um, in June before the um, March on Washington, stating that this nation for all its hopes and all its boasts will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. And so he was working really hard to get a lot of these um, 
amendments passed to make sure that black citizens had equal rights. Um, and he did pass the Equal Pay Act in 1963, um, which was supposed to abolish wage disparity based on sex, um, as well as this being, so the Civil Rights Movement, March on Washington, is all the same year that The Feminine Mystique is published. So you can imagine sort of the foil there um, between the two events. Unfortunately, um, Kennedy is assassinated um, before any of the bills were passed in 1963. And so Lyndon B. Johnson um, is sworn in as president and he pushed for these two pieces as well, which is good. Um, and so in 1964, we have the passing of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, um, was which written to end segregation in public places and ban employment discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And then... Um, in a year, we'll have another one passed as well. Or I'm sorry. No, wait. Yeah, this is Civil Rights Act. Okay. So there were still protests going on quite frequently um, because they were working um, on a broader voting rights movement um, because black citizens in the South especially were being kept from voting at the voting booths like we talked about. I mean, we're still um what almost 80 plus years into this fight um and so there were selma to montgomery marches in alabama um and they were um black citizens were trying to ex execute their constitutional right to vote um and this was one of the big events um the march on edmund pettus bridge on march 7th of 1965 and it was organized by Amelia Boynton Roy Robinson and James Bevel, um, as well as John Lewis being a big participant who's right here in front, um, who was 25 years old at the time. And they were leading about 600 protesters across the bridge into Selma, Alabama. So they met with police there. And these... 600 marchers were violently attacked by policemen and tear gassed and beaten with billy clubs while crossing this bridge, um, which became known as Bloody Sunday um, because of the outrageous violence that occurred there. One of the acts that became really um, important to the civil rights movement was the beating of Amelia um, Boynton Robinson. Um, she was a very famous figure in the civil rights movement and she was beaten unconscious and her bloody image published in newspaper photos drew national outrage um, to the cause. You can see her here. Um, and they had to sort of carry her to safety and this really, um, this horrific event really bolstered people to start seeing um, how much black citizens were being kept from their rights um, and brought a sort of a lot of national attention to it. Um, also, along with the beating of John Lewis, who's here on the ground. Um, I have some videos um, of that here. So this is um, Robinson talking here. Came up. The horses came up. And, and uh, the posse came up, the state troopers came up, the police department came up and started beating us. <laughs> and I stood up there. And finally, I fell. I fell when the posse or whoever it was hit me and it was below my shoulder. And I looked at him like I thought he was crazy. And he said, run. Then he hit me back of my neck and I was unconscious. And I didn't know what happened because I was unconscious. I understand from some of the people, more than one, that I stayed there so long, everybody ha had run or hid. They said to uh, Jim Clark, who was the sheriff, there's somebody dead over there. And I don't know how long I was there. And he said, "We, this is send an ambulance. 
And he said, I'm not sending an ambulance over there. If there's anybody that is dead, let the buses eat them. That's and what Jim Clark said. If there's anybody who's dead, let the let buzzards, the eat, buzzards them. eat them. It's insane to hear her talk about the way that she was treated, right? And the way that she had to be carried away um, because nobody cared if she lived or died. Um, and there were two more marches on Washington, or sorry, I'm sorry, um, across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on March 9th, um, where Martin Luther King Jr. took them across with no violence, um, as well as on the 21st when President Lyndon B. Johnson protected them. Um, so there were several more protests of this, and I'll put up another video about um, protests to get um, black citizens the right to vote, because I think I will have one from CNN too. Um, but uh, Robinson here became a really big figure who she was just talking, um, the woman that was just talking, um, Amelia Boynton Robinson, um, became a really big figure in the civil rights movement and really continued to fight for those rights. Um, and this is her. She died at 104 years old, um, but this is her walking across, well, um, participating in a walk across the Edmund Pettus Bridge with President Obama in 2015. Um, so you can imagine 104 years old. Um, that's insane. What a powerful um, woman she is. So there was a continuance um, of issues in um, the government, depending on Redis residency that restricted different um, figures from voting um, black men and women. Um, a lot of those restrictions depended on literacy or moral character or, character or ability to pay um, poll taxes. And so they would use these as a way to sort of legally exclude women from voting. Um, if you didn't speak English well, they wouldn't allow you to vote. Um, many poor women, regardless of race, had no ability to pay the poll taxes. And it wasn't even until 1980 that we had women turning out in the full, in full force as much as um, men. Um, one of the big figures as part of this movement, just like um, Robinson, as well as John Lewis, is Fannie Lou Hamer. And we just talked about her in 1961 with the conversations about hysterectomies. Um, but she worked with the Student Not Violence Coordinating Committee and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And in 1962, she led 17 volunteers to register to vote in Mississippi, um, and they were denied the right to vote under unfair literacy tests. Um, and the group was harassed and fined another $100 on the bus that they were on because the bus was too yellow, um, which caused the firing of her husband from his job. Um, in June of 1963, she was registered to vote, but arrested for sitting on a whites only bus station restaurants in South Carolina and was beaten um, so severely that she had lifelong injuries of a blood clot, kidney damage and leg damage. In 1964, she finally um, made it to the Democratic, Democratic National Convention as part of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And um, she made this speech um, at the conference. And Lyndon B. Johnson tried to kind of, ironically enough, even though he was very supportive of the civil rights movement, um, or so it seemed, um, he televised a press conference at the same time as her speech um, so that it wouldn't be seen, but they um, aired it later anyway. Um, so I have that here as well. The testimony before the Credentials Committee, the FDP had a lineup of very different people. They had Rita Schwerner, the widow of Mickey, who had been killed in Neshoba County. They had Martin Luther King. Everybody knew King. The seating of the delegation from the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party has political and moral significance far beyond the borders of Mississippi are the halls of this convention. But the highlight of the testimony was that of Fannie Lou Hamer. The sharecropper who had been evicted from her plantation had come to symbolize the Mississippi movement. Mr. Chairman, and to the Credentials Committee, 
It was the 31st of August in 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola to try to register to become first class citizens. We was met in Indianola with, by policemen. The president, Lyndon Johnson, he's not afraid of Martin Luther King's testimony. He's afraid of Fannie Lou Hamer's testimony. And so he decides that the country should not see her testify live. Johnson is in the White House, and he convened an impromptu press conference. We will return to this scene in Atlantic City, but now we switch to the White House and NBC's Robert Gorelsky. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. On this day, nine months ago, he did it knowing that they would break away, thinking he might announce who his choice of vice president was going to be. Instead, he gets up there and he announces, get this, he announces that it's nine months to the day since, since Governor Connolly, who was there, was shot along with President Kennedy. So he announced a nine-month anniversary. Everybody's scratching their heads. Thank you very much. And then he leaves. And by that time... Annie Lou Hamer's testimony was over. However, it backfired on Johnson because it became a story that she had been taken off television and in the news that night and for, for days afterwards, they replayed her testimony. I was carried to the county jail and put in the booking room. They left some of the people in the booking room and began to place us in jail. She had Mississippi in her bones. Martin Luther King or the SNCC field secretaries, uh, they couldn't do what Fannie Lou Hamer did. They couldn't be a sharecropper and express what it meant, right? And that's what Fannie Lou Hamer um, did. And it wasn't too long before three white men came to my cell. One of these men was State Highway Patrol. He said, we're going to make you wish you were dead. So I'll put that full speech on the Moodle. It's about 10 minutes long. Um, so you can listen to it. And this really helped to bring a lot of attention to voting rights and voting issues um, that were um, being stopped by people, um, including the police, right, by federal forces to not be able to vote, which was illegal at this point. And so she became a really big symbol um, for Southern figures and Southern women really fighting for the right to vote. Um, these are some famous quotes by her. I don't want you to say, honey, I'm behind you. We'll move. I don't want you back there because you could be 200 miles behind. I want you to say, I am with you and we'll go up this freedom road together. If I fall, I'll fall five feet and four inches forward in the right for freedom. I won't back off. And this is a book that was published about her um, as well. A children's book, I believe. I love all these children books about famous um, black female figures because I wish someone would have read them to me at some point. Um, so because of her actions, as well as Martin Luther King's, obviously, um, they passed the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Um, Emily Boynton was invited to witness the signing. Um, and it, um, its intention was to overcome legal barriers at the state and local levels that prevented um, black men and women from exercising their right to vote under the 15th Amendment. We also have the Black Power Movement going on at this time, which I'm not going to talk about extensively, um, but flourished in the late 60s and early 70s, creating economic, social, and political power. Um, and they were looking less for integration into the system, uh, but more on um, Black self-reliance, self-defense, and racial pride. So a little different from um, Martin Luther King's um, more integrated idea of working together. Um, they worked to pursue freedom, equality, and justice by any means necessary. So they had a lot of famous figures. Um, I'm going to list off a couple here. Um, but because of the assassination of Malcolm X on February 21st, 1965, we have the Black Power Movement really 
um, bursting upon the scene and really becoming more popular until the early 70s. So you have famous female figures. Um, I have four of them here, like Angela Davis, who was a radical educator and activist for civil rights and social issues. And she worked in a neighborhood that was often targeted by the KKK. Um, Gloria Richardson, who worked hard, um, she was very interested in violence and using the violence um, to fight um, back against the police um, and other um, violent groups. Elaine Brown is another here. I believe she's on the far left. Um, as well as Kathleen Kleber. There were other couple um, of famous laws and moments um, as well for the black community, such as um, Loving versus Virginia in the Supreme Court prohibited laws um, that stopped interracial marriages with Mildred and Richard Loving um, being at the center of that. So finally, um, in 1967, if you can imer imagine, the Supreme Court prohibited laws that stopped interracial marriages, um, which I believe is what I just said. Sorry, guys, I'm tired. We have uh, Aretha Franklin recording Respect in 1967, which I will put on the Moodle as well. We have Shirley Chisholm in 1968 being the first black woman elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, and uh, she was a very famous figure and um, worked very hard for civil rights of the black community as well. And she even ran for president on a major ticket in 1972. Not winning, obviously. Um, I believe Nixon won uh, that election. We also have the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. on April 4th of 68, um, which really was sort of a changing tide um, for the civil rights movement and was um, really this horrific moment um, for people as they sort of saw their big leader um, fall. Um, other big moments by female singers. Um, like Aretha Franklin uh, or Nina Simone with her song To Be Young, Gifted, and Black. Other famous figures like Sarah Vaughn, Pearl Bailey were singers, Dina Washington, Eartha Kitt, um, famous actress. I think she does the voice of um, Misma. Misma? Did I make that name up? In the Emperor's New Groove. Um, maybe that's an, something that's familiar to you guys. Um, she's in a lot of films and movies obviously um and i believe she sings as well um and of course the supremes there were a lot of famous black women's movements and groups that we don't get to spend a lot of time talking about just for time's sake um but i've listed them here um and i'll probably give you a larger list maybe more comprehensive list of um female political leaders that we didn't get to talk about because there are many um, that are kind of in I would say in the margins just because of their gender um, they've been kind of pushed out of the major dialogues um, about the civil rights movement so when we talk about the second wave it differs greatly from the first wave in a couple of different things and we're going to look at um, some art here in the next series of PowerPoints um, that I'm recording after these, um, which are um, revolving around the, I'm sorry, the second wave has a lot of interesting ways that artists are um, talking and thinking about art. And so we'll see that when we get there. Um, but with the feminine mystique jumpstarting the second wave of feminism, we have ideas such as the personal is political. So instead of um, women fighting for collective suffrage, they're instead um, using this sort of mantra, which is that um, they are turning inwards to redefine how they view themselves and the everyday, the domestic and the specifically embodied, uh, the universalizing female voice in art. Um, it focused around art and art history, not just politics. So while the first wave is not necessarily invested extensively in 
artistic practice, we're going to see that quite extensively in this second wave here, which is why we're spending so much more time on it. Um, we're going to use Artists are going to use the female body to embrace the female experience with sexuality and vaginal imagery, as well as collaborative art making, and it includes women of numerous classes, races, and sexualities. So it is a much more inclusive um, feminist movement, but again, you still have um, some separation between white and black um, feminists and BIPOC feminists as well. So when we really start to see that take off with collective work is going to be in the third wave, um, which is unfortunate, but true. So we are going to talk about that here um, in the next series of PowerPoints or videos. I'm sorry. <laughs>